High-speed rail lines began popping up in Europe and Asia in the early 80s, and passengers were exhilarated. Trains are, for lack of a better word, sexy. Going at 200 miles per hour on land sounds very exciting, very futuristic. Politicians see opportunity for a legacy for themselves. With high-profile rollouts in France and Japan, bullet train mania was underway. And then reality set in. Unfortunately, the costs of building such projects usually vastly outweigh the benefits. Supporters who claim that most high-speed rail systems operate at a profit use accounting tricks like leaving out construction costs and indirect subsidies. If you tabulate real costs... Two high-speed rail lines in the world operate at a profit. Rail is more of a 19th century technology. We don't have to go through these headaches and cost overruns to build a future transportation system. What we're talking about is a vision for high-speed rail in America. But politicians can't resist the ribbon-cutting ceremonies and imagery of sleek trains hurtling through the lush countryside. So the projects keep coming. Don't be afraid of the future. California's high-speed rail line was sold to voters on the bold promise that it will someday whisk passengers between San Francisco and Los Angeles in under three hours. Nine years later, the project has turned into such a disaster that its biggest political champion is now suing to stop it from happening. I say we cannot afford not to pass Proposition 1A and build high-speed rail in California. It is foolish and it is almost a crime to sell bonds and encumber the taxpayers of California at a time when this is no longer high-speed rail. An icon of California politics known as the Great Dissenter, Quentin Kopp introduced the legislation that established the rail line and became chairman of the High-Speed Rail Authority. The litigation which is pending will result, I am confident, in the termination of the high-speed rail authorities' deceiving plan. Voters supported the bond measure to pay for construction on the condition that the train would be self-sustaining. According to one recent estimate, the project's latest iteration would suck up at least $100 million in annual subsidies. The ballot measure prohibits taxpayer subsidy, and that was an important part of convincing voters in 2008 to approve the bond measure. In the meantime, lawsuits have multiplied, private investors have fled, and even the official price tag has nearly doubled, from $33 billion to $64 billion. When the legislature cleared the way for the rail authority to begin selling the voter-approved bonds in early 2017, the agency declared it a milestone. COP was livid. It's deceit. That's not a milestone. It's desperation because high-speed rail authority is out of money. You've got to do what you promised the voters. And you can't change that without going back to the voters. Attorney Stuart Flashman has represented environmental and transportation groups in several lawsuits against the rail authority. He now aims to stop the project on the grounds that the agency broke numerous promises to voters. They're going the wrong way. They're, they're basically doing this in a way that is very inefficient and will not work. Baruch Feigenbaum says that starting construction, even though there isn't enough money allocated to finish the project, is part of a deliberate plan to extract further taxpayer subsidies. Their strategy is to get enough of it built so that basically there's going to be so much money sunk in the project that they're going to argue it's going to be cheaper to complete it than it's going to be to abandon it. Kopp and Flashman, however, still believe in high-speed rail. It's just that this particular train has been hijacked by special interests. Right now it's a boondoggle, I, I, I have to agree with that, and, and it's sad. And why couldn't they do it right? Because they'd made a bunch of political promises to people along the way. We'll go through your city, oh, and we'll go through your city. It's winding its way around, adding something like 70 miles beyond the most direct route. Since rail projects are driven more by politics than consumer demand, nonsensical design decisions are typical. That's true even in France and Japan, where a couple of the first high-speed rail lines were actually profitable. After building those lines, both of those countries built a bunch of other lines that have no hope of ever being profitable, not because the rail folks necessarily wanted to build them, but because the politicians said, hey, city A has rail, I want it in my city. 
Flashman says the California project has also become a land grab. This was going to go right through the middle of Kings County, right across people's farmlands, and we had a farmer whose land it was going across, a fellow named John Toss, and his name is on the lawsuit. By design, high-speed rail lines require wide swaths of land, which often means seizing property. Even getting rural land can be a problem. There's a project in Texas that is proposing to build a high-speed rail line between Dallas and Houston. And one of the reasons why it may not be viable is the large amount of rural land they have to seize from ranchers. Ranchers have had this land in their family for generations. They might be growing crops on it, and they're not real interested in selling that land. As for the often promised environmental benefits of high-speed rail, Flashman acknowledges they won't materialize in California. Ironically, doing this high-speed rail construction with the huge amounts of concrete and steel involved is actually increasing greenhouse gas production. It would probably take 50 to 80 years in order to negate all of the greenhouse gases emitted during the building of the line. California's project is extraordinary in some ways. As envisioned, it will be both the slowest bullet train in the world and the most expensive. They're using a blended track so it won't get to the speed they promised. Because it's going through the Central Valley, it won't meet the timetable that was laid out in the ballot initiative. It will be conventional rail, which in a way is parallel to existing Amtrak service. It'll also be competing with air travel at a time when a new generation of quiet supersonic planes is about to take to the skies. Autonomous vehicles will soon give passengers the same freedom to sleep, work, or read as train travelers. And then there's Elon Musk's plans for Hyperloop pod transport in a near vacuum tube at speeds up to 800 miles an hour. I say let Elton Musk develop it, because I'm not advocating using taxpayer money for an unproven, untested. Concept. I think if government gets out of the way of deciding which transportation modes we need in the future, the private sector will do a much better job of innovating and creating profitable transportation modes that people want to use instead of locking in a suboptimal choice from the 19th century.